All right, looks like we're live. Let's see if anyone's out there. Let's see if anyone joins. Let's see. Let me figure out the page here. Let's see how it works. So I got a couple good questions, mostly about uh, accuracy, which will be interesting to talk about. The difference between accuracy and precision, how short barrels affect that. Uh, looks like I had a uh, question here by Eddie. So Eddie wrote in asking about whether uh, you should cut your short barrel or your barrel down to be short. Well, I mean, I, I, I can't make a decision for you, but I've had great success with shorter barrels. Now, the biggest myth I hear about barrel length is that somehow, um, and ignoring all the double entendres that could be said here, uh, the biggest myth about barrel length I hear is that longer barrels are more accurate. So you go to the range and people think, oh, look at that rifle. I can really shoot a long distance. That must be a sniper rifle because that has a long barrel. Well, when I show up with my rifle and it ends up having um, 16, 18, at least less than 20 inch barrels when I shoot at my 308s, uh, one of the most common responses I get is there's no way that could be accurate. You know, that, that somehow um, the short barrel is going to affect the accuracy. Well, it's not true. Uh, barrel length has nothing to do with accuracy. In fact, I think a shorter barrel can be more accurate than a longer barrel, and I'll get into that. But first, let me talk a little bit about what accuracy is. Accuracy is one of those misused terms like caliber. Now, not misused in that I want people to stop doing it, but misused in that accuracy is really only about the ability to hit at a target. So precision is usually what people mean when they talk about accuracy. So if you can picture a tight group on a target, so a very tight group, that's precision. Even if they're scattered all over the target, but they're centered around the center, that's accurate. Uh, I like to think of it to remember like a precision rifle can be precise on its own. You can bolt it in a vise, and it doesn't have any idea which way it's shooting. It doesn't know where the target is, but it'll be precise every time you pull the trigger. It takes you to make that accurate, which means to aim it at the right target, to adjust and compensate for environmental factors appropriately. That's what accuracy is. So I get what people are asking when I say, does it make it less accurate? Well, really what they're asking is, does it make it less precise? Um, but no, so let's talk a little bit about that. So accuracy, really precision, I, uh, it's just, we use the term accuracy. Accuracy is effectively doing the same thing over and over again. It's all about consistency, okay? If you, if you picked up my book, you'll see I put it at least five times in the book. I, I even bolded on a couple pages. You know, accuracy is all about consistency. So if you can get a bullet to do the same thing every time, you're gonna have an incredibly precise or accurate rifle. So for example, if the bullet, when it goes to come out at the end of the barrel, it hooks 45 degrees and goes off on a crazy angle. As long as it does that same crazy angle every time, you're gonna have a really precise rifle or accurate rifle. You just might have to mount your scope crooked. You might have to make uh, some big compensation for that, but it doesn't matter. The, the bullet doesn't need to be on some magic path. It just needs to be on the same path each time. So now let's talk about what barrel length has to do with that. Well, as long as your rifle's barrel is long enough that you're getting enough powder to burn to get the bullet out, right? I'm not talking about a one inch barrel on a rifle. I'm talking about a shorter barrel, you know, let's say 18 inches for a 308 that shorter barrel is still getting enough powder burn for the bullet to fly. It's still getting enough powder burn for it to reach some of the far targets. Now it's going to slow down some, but that's what you're giving up when you have a shorter barrel. So the longer barrel versus the shorter barrel is all about velocity. Here's another myth. Faster is not more accurate. Remember, accuracy is consistency. So many people think that a certain cartridge or a certain uh, rifle platform is going to be able to be more precise and more accurate because the bullet's going so, so fast. Guys, that doesn't matter. Um, some match grade pistols are 45 auto. That's a pretty slow bullet. Remember, it's all about consistency. It doesn't matter that it gets there with the arc of a football. It doesn't matter that it might take 30 seconds to get to the target for the bullet. As long as it does it the same every time, it's gonna be incredibly accurate. So when it comes to target shooting only, short barrels are great. Um, you lose some velocity, but you can get more precision, and this is why. The barrel can be relatively stiffer. Now, I'm gonna overstate this a little bit, and I understand that might make people upset, but the, the overstatement here is 
Imagine taking a stick of a certain diameter. And if that stick is a certain length that you can bend and easily snap it, if you take that same diameter stick and make a shorter one and try and snap the same stick, it's going to feel tougher. It's going to feel stiffer. It's not a better, bigger diameter. The stick isn't stiffer. You just have less leverage. Well, the same principle applies when it comes to barrels. A very long barrel has more leverage on itself. It can whip, and gravity can pull it, and it can shake around a whole lot more. Where the same diameter barrel that's shorter is going to be relatively stiffer than that same size barrel that's longer. So relatively stiffer means what? More consistent. More consistent means you have a chance for more precision. More precision means it's going to be easier for you to be accurate. So a shorter barrel actually is a benefit. It, it, stop looking at it like a, um, a sacrifice that you need to make. Well, I can get the barrel shorter, but as long as I don't lose too much accuracy, no, not at all. Uh, my, my rifle, for example, shot better. I was shooting decent groups. It was a Remington 700 police. It was shooting okay. Chopped the barrel down to 18 inches. Groups tightened right up. It was amazing. Now, let's talk about the velocity loss. Velocity loss is going to equal energy loss. And it's also going to equal more wind drift at distance. It's going to equal more drop at distance to gravity. Now, I discussed it in the book. It doesn't drop more to gravity because it's going slower, as in... There's some sort of magic momentum that a bullet has that resists gravity. A lot of people think that. A lot of people think because the bullet is traveling so, so fast that somehow it's able to resist gravity. Well, that's not true. That's, that's not physics. Uh, the bullet is going to drop at the same rate, whether it's flying horizontally at 3,000 feet a second or whether you just dropped it. Matter of fact, speaking of physics, that's a, a, a common physics question. If you took a bullet next to a firearm and you shot one bullet and dropped the other one, which one's going to hit the ground first? Well, the answer is they're going to hit the ground at the exact same time. One of them is just going to hit the ground way far away. So it's not that it's going slower so somehow gravity has more of an effect on it, like it can pull harder on it, or it has less momentum. What's happening is because it's going slower, it takes longer to get to the target. So if a bullet that could get to the target in two seconds falls a certain amount, well, a bullet that takes three seconds to get to the same target is going to fall quite a bit further. That's because, one, it's been exposed to gravity for three full seconds, which means it's dropping for three full seconds, so it's got a lot longer time to drop, but also because gravity is an accelerated force. So not only is it dropping for more time, it's actually dropping faster each and every second it's exposed. It goes faster and faster and faster until it reaches its terminal velocity, which we're not going to talk about here. My point being is the slower velocity, yeah, you're going to need to come up more on your scope. So, for example, out at the sniper range I used to teach at in Arizona, there was a 920-yard uh, steel target. That was a very common target for people to shoot off of a platform that we had. And most students would be able to shoot that target at 32 minutes of angle with a 308 with a standard sniper rifle length barrel and I would have to shoot it at 34 minutes or maybe 36 depending on the ammo so yes I had to come up with more elevation at the same target because my bullet was slower it took it longer to get there but I ask you if you're already coming up 32 minutes is coming up to 39 really that big of a difference uh, I mean sorry 34 36 no I, I don't think it's that big of a difference um, I, I think it's a, a welcome trade-off for a lighter firearm a firearm that I can carry through the woods, I can get in and out of a vehicle with easier. Uh, my rifle with a full length stock is actually just shy of a meter stick. So picture that, just, or a yard stick, fine, a yard stick. That's easy to get in and out of a truck. That's easy to get out of a doorway. And yes, I have to come up a couple more minutes when I'm shooting at 900 yards, but big deal. Now, one problem that is a big deal is wind. So yes, the longer it takes, the more the wind can affect it much the same like gravity. It's just being exposed to that wind longer. Um, the third reason that can be a detriment, the third possible negative, is energy. If you're hunting, if your goal is to put the biggest impact of energy on the target, you lose the velocity, you're going to lose a lot of that energy. Uh, that's just a, a fact, right? Most of the energy comes from velocity, right? Velocity in the equation gets squared where the mass gets halved. So velocity is, is much, much, truly exponentially more important. So what you're losing velocity, which means you're going to lose energy, you're going to lose elevation, you're going to lose wind, but you're likely going to have a more accurate rifle, more precise. You're likely going to have an easier to carry, an easier to handle rifle. Um, and heck, you got a conversation piece now. When people ask you about it at the range, you can, you can prove them wrong. So 
to your question, should you cut your barrel down? Sure, cut it down, have fun. Now, I wouldn't be a firearms attorney if I didn't warn you, uh, don't cut it under 16 inches without making it an SBR. That's an NFA firearm, so don't do that. Um, but 18 inch, awesome. 20 inches is even a better compromise because 20 inches is still long enough that you're not really into that uh, huge velocity loss that you get down to that 18 inches. So 18 inches, 20 inches, have fun, do it. And you know what? Worst case scenario, it doesn't work out for your rifle, you get a new barrel. Um, people don't agree with me all the time on this one, but barrels are a wear item on a firearm. Eventually you're going to shoot it out and you replace it. You don't, don't get in, in love with the barrel anymore and you get in love with the tires that are on your truck. So, uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Eddie, I just saw your comment there. You're welcome. I, I hope that was clarifying without over clarifying. Um, yeah, you better get the book. I, you, that should be a prerequisite. I should make you send in a picture of the book with questions. <laughs> All right, anybody, have, anybody else have any other questions? Any other topics they want to talk about? Uh, I challenge you, make it not about shooting. I don't care. We can talk about anything in the outdoors, uh, backpacking, rock climbing, uh, things like that. No? All right. Well, I say backpacking and out outdoor stuff because when I left the military, I went back to Phoenix, Arizona, and started going back to college and used the GI Bill. And what I ended up doing is I figured out a system that allowed me to uh, go to the same college that I was teaching at. I took a teaching job teaching things like uh, what my I used to call Ranger 101. I taught rock climbing and backpacking and, and uh, land navigation. It was, it was a really good time. I liked it. All right, looks like we got a question from Pat here. Ryan, you keep mentioning velocity and how much elevation change one versus another firearm. My question is, what kind of velocities am I using or seeing to make my long range shots and consistent? Uh, it says see more, but I can't see it on my phone. Sorry, Pat. Um, so I'm not quite understanding your question. If you're just asking what velocities I'm seeing, I'd be happy to share some velocities um, with you. But Pat, I think you heard, I hope you heard the first part where I was discussing the velocity doesn't matter for consistency. So your question seems to suppose what velocity am I getting to so that I'm consistent as if I wasn't going to be consistent at another velocity. That's not the case. It doesn't matter if my 308 is leaving the barrel at 500 feet a second. I mean, okay, it does matter. But I'm saying just for precision purposes or for accuracy purposes, it doesn't matter if the bullet can reach the target. As long as it does it the same every single time, it doesn't matter. So a faster bullet might actually uh, have less consistency. There are plenty of rifles out there that have screaming fast bullets that have maybe bad ammunition or might be a bad rifle that even though the bullet is just insanely fast, it's inconsistent and therefore it's going to be inaccurate. And that throws the whole, well, it's faster so it needs to be more accurate out the window is no. Remember, accuracy is consistency. It has nothing to do with a magic threshold over which it can be accurate. Now, some cartridges do like what they call an accuracy node of speed. And that's just because that particular bullet of that length and that twist likes to be stable at that speed. That's true. But don't be fooled into thinking that the speed is beneficial when it's higher. Don't think about the fact like, oh, I need to get up to the accuracy node. Believe it or not, sometimes you need to get down to that accuracy node. So again, don't play well when you think about velocity, tend to think faster is better. Often it is, but do not correlate a fast bullet with an accurate bullet. A slow one can be perfectly accurate. All right, uh, Doug asked a question here. How many shots with different bullets of powder should you shoot to find around your gun likes? Um, well, you're not going to like this answer, but as many as it takes. <laughs> uh, the answer might be one if you find one that, that shoots well. This comes back to defining your target. It also applies to defining your accuracy. So what do I mean by that? Well, and Doug, trust me, I will get to your question. Uh, I just got to get sidetracked for a second. You tell me what's accurate for you. You tell me what you want to do. Um, for me, with most of my rifles, uh, just under a minute of angle is great. I, I mean, if I, if I had a gun that had an off-the-shelf brand of ammo that was inexpensive and available that shot three quarters of a minute, maybe I just call it a day. I mean, if it's not a target bullseye gun, if it's a tactical field gun or if it's a hunting rifle, done. Uh, maybe I'd tinker with it when I have some extra time, but I'm not going to go hunting 
for the most perfect cartridge if that one works. I mean, even if it's just at one minute, one inch to 100 yards for a hunting rifle, that means I could hit a pie plate at 1,000 yards every single time. Uh, that's going to be plenty accurate. So when I say it comes down to the finding your target, I mean how big are you trying to hit? At what distance? Is your target a half inch at 100 yards? Well, then you're going to have to hunt for a little bit to get the ammo to do that. However, if your target is the kill zone of a deer at 300 yards, one minute of angle accuracy is going to be plenty for you. So for me, I would probably hunt for a cartridge that was available, that if I forgot it on the hunt or got confiscated by TSA, I could pick it up at a store when I got to Alaska, hopefully, uh, and it's going to have good bullet performance and effect on the animal to make a, to make a clean kill. Um, now... If you are, I'm just making up this number here, 20 different bullets and load and powder combinations deep into a rifle and you still can't get it to shoot, you probably need to stop because there might be something else wrong. You know, make sure your scope's not loose or something like that or the rifle doesn't have a problem with it. Um, I like to keep caliber consistency because I like having uniformity on some of my bullets. So if it's going to be a target gun, I have a few bullets I like. And if I have them, I will work to usually make that bullet work. I won't find a whole bunch of different bullets. Uh, I may not be optimal by doing that, but at least I know I'll get good enough. Uh, Doug, I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, you said long range for hunting, 338 Lapua. Um, what do you mean? You're, you're trying to ask what kind of round you should do for that? Uh, you, you can, surely you can use it for, for hunting. I, I actually know a couple guys that were using the 338 uh, Lapua for hunting uh, well before it became in vogue with the uh, with NATO militaries that they, they saw the utility of the round. Now there's some other rounds that are starting to outperform it, but I think 338 Lapua is pretty pretty amazing. I have a rifle in it solely because I could possibly use it for hunting too. I don't know if I ever will, but I like to kid myself that I might. So, all right. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, we're doing good. Oh, there's more stuff popping in. All right, so for load development, um, I probably have a lot to learn in that area, honestly. I've been hanging out at this long range range near my house, and some of these guys are, are insane target shooters. And uh, what I like about what they do is they take it so seriously and they get down to the details that I've probably never even cared about. Like, honestly, I don't worry about my case wall thickness. I, I get enough accuracy out of my rifles and, and ammunition to get what I need to do. Again, though, I'm not um, shooting these little tiny groups off of a bench rest. It's, I don't look down upon it. It's just not my thing. If I hit a target off of a bench rest, um, well, that's not much of a challenge for me usually. So what I like to do is get to different positions, get into prone, or I like to shoot quick. You know, shoot at the five, then the two, then the six. Try and hit a moving target. I, I just and I'm stuck on the more practical application of long range rifles. But if you're a bench rest shooter and you wanna mark where the primer goes in, God bless you. Uh, I just need to go learn it. So someone asked me, Joseph, my thoughts on carbon fiber wrapped barrels. They don't work yet. So that's a bold statement, but I really want them to work. I, I think the idea is very cool. Uh, it makes complete sense. I like that people are trying to think outside the box. Uh, if you heard the first 10 minutes of, of, of this video or this podcast, it's been me talking about accuracy is all about consistency. And as long as you can get it consistent, it's going to be accurate. It doesn't matter if it goes 45 degrees out of the corner of the barrel. And the idea of taking a barrel and getting the more relative stiffness, so therefore you have more consistency out of it, by wrapping it with a material that's lighter than steel, that's awesome. I think it's a great idea. And my first concerns were about the durability of the carbon fiber. And I can tell you without a doubt that those concerns are now gone. I've seen enough barrels, I've seen enough tests on the barrels with carbon fiber on them. Those things are amazingly tough and amazingly strong. However, I don't know what they look like after 10 years. I don't know what they look like after they've been abused because I've never shot them that hard. I've seen them smacked against the cinder block, but I don't know if they're gonna delaminate or anything. The reason I say they don't work yet is because I haven't seen the results that say they do. Um, I'm building a rifle right now with a carbon fiber wrap barrel because I want to give it a shot. But unfortunately, the examples I've seen, which are probably limited, the examples I've seen so far 
don't shoot any better than a steel barrel and actually some of them shoot worse. Um, I've seen some hit or miss results with it and I think that although that might sound like an unfair statement from me that's probably a testament to why um, the military hasn't gone with them yet you know for like the PSR contract or things like that. Um, even some of the more recent federal contracts you know DEA rifle they had a chance for that and they didn't they went with a stainless uh, steel barrel. So I hope we get there someday I don't know if it's there yet. I'm still going to be willing to be a guinea pig. I'm building a rifle with it. But again, I'm okay with the men of the angle accuracy on a hunting rifle. Uh, some of these, you know, insane target shooters uh, aren't. They're, they're going to want the rifle. So they're, they're going to need the, the old-fashioned steel. Now, is, is stainless steel uh, better than carbon steel? People tell me it is. I, I, I trust them. I mean, it makes sense that, that stainless steel would be harder so it might last longer. But to be honest with you, my chromoly steel barrels shoot just fine. Um, I think one of the big differences in the barrels, besides the care and consistency that's taken with them, is how the rifling is cut. So the standard in the industry for most accurate used to always be hammer forged. So a hammer forged barrel, they start with a mandrel, so a really hard piece of steel that was a reverse image of the rifling. So it would be a rod with the rifling sticking out of it. They put the steel over it in this insane press, which is really cool to see running. Just hammers the heck out of that steel and it smashes the barrel and forms it and molds it around that mandrel and then they pull the mandrel out and what you're left is a perfect mold impression of the rifling because they just beat it to death around that mandrel. The reason that's so accurate is it goes back to what I'm probably going to call this podcast, accuracy, consistency is the key to accuracy, is it was the same every time. You know, the mandrel might wear down, but it was a minute amount. You were able to get the same pressures, the same everything. Uh, hammer forged uh, rifles, they take a while to do. They're a little expensive, but the steel is really nice and hammered down tight. Now, so we looked for more efficient, uh, I hate to say the word cheaper, ways of getting barrels done. So they started looking to things like button rifling. Um, there's also cut rifling, which is kind of in the middle. Cut rifling, they can actually go in and cut them all at once. They can go in and cut one groove at a time and come back and cut the next groove. Some of your really high-end barrels, like Bartline barrels, are actually cut. Uh, I think, logically, it tells me to be the least consistent because you have a chance to be different every single time. But for some reason, it really, really works. Uh, they're really accurate barrels. And that's where you can actually do things like gain twist, where you can actually, instead of having a consistent twist rate, you can have the twist rate slowly get faster and faster because you're controlling on the cut. Now, button rifling is the cheapest, fastest, uh, most inexpensive barrels are button rifled, but don't think it's bad. Uh, I, I've seen some amazing button rifle barrels that you look at and they shouldn't be accurate, and they are. Uh, the button rifling is a hole is drilled through the barrel, a rod is stuck through the barrel, and a small button, you know, maybe an inch long, that has little angled cuts in it. It's put on the end of the rod and it's pulled through with extreme force and that goes through and it smashes and cuts itself and it turns on its own with those angle grooves and it cuts the rifling in and it can be a very fast way to make barrels um so some of these less expensive rifles some of these you know savages uh things like even the remington 783 that have these i don't know cheap barrels just shoot because they figured out button rifling they got it to work so I'm probably more concerned about just the quality of the barrel, less about the material. But uh, I do hope they, they, they get those carbon fiber wrap barrels. Uh, Steve, you're pretty new to long range. Any advice? Uh, yeah, go read a book. <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, don't go crazy on buying all your equipment. That's my advice. Uh, go to the long range. Go talk to guys that actually know what they're doing. And take everything with a grain of salt, because there's going to be a lot of wives' tales and a lot of myths that go along there. But uh, try stuff out before you rush in to buy everything. And do not, please do not chase the next new fad or uh, the next piece of gear that's going to make you more accurate. You are going to be so much better off getting a decent gun with a good scope and good ammunition and good training than you are going getting a high-end custom gun. Matter of fact, I will tell you now, I'm so insanely impressed with the Tikas right now for an entry level gun. You can go to Cabela's and pick yourself up a Tika 308, especially the tactical ones. And that gun is going to shoot circles around anything else you're going to get anywhere near that price point. The bolt's going to be just 
ball bearing smooth, the trigger is awesome, I can't say enough about these rifles. Um, go do that and get that $650 gun or the $900 gun if you get all the bells and whistles on it and just shoot and shoot and shoot and after a few years you're going to get so good that finally you can move up to the nicer rifle. Just don't do it the other way around, okay? So there's my advice. Doug asks, do suppressors make a rifle shoot better? Yes, I know that you don't have the kick from the gun. Your thoughts? Well, sometimes. <laughs> so I've seen some uh, silencers. Yes, I call them silencers. You can call them suppressors. Uh, I see some silencers have made guns shoot better. For example, my Mark 12 that I had in the military uh, had an Ops Inc. suppressor on it. See, I just said suppressor. Um, made the gun more accurate. It was a great shooting gun without the silencer on it. You put the silencer on and the groups got even better. Um, good silencers on good guns, that tends to happen. Now, just because it gets better precision doesn't necessarily mean the accuracy is better. So remember we talked about in the first five minutes of this podcast is it might make the groups get tighter, but it might shift where the groups are. So that's better precision, but less accuracy. You might have to move and adjust where the impact is. That happens sometimes. Uh, I see bad results with quick detach silencers. The accuracy ten, precision tends to decrease or you have inconsistency. Also silencers that have angled baffles. So perfectly flat baffles are great for accuracy because it's a consistent force on the bullet as it travels through, but it's not great for sound suppression because it doesn't help de deviate the, the wind off the path and make a whole lot of turbulence. So angled baffles are really good for making the can quiet but they're not great for making the can accurate. So you'll notice that some of the high accuracy cans just look like they're perfect washers welded one after the next, whereas the heavy duty machine gun cans, quick attach cans will have angle baffles in there. So you can try that. Um, yeah, it acts as a muzzle brake for it comes to recoil in a bit, but if you don't have an adjustable gas system and you're shooting a semi-auto gun, you can sometimes feel like the gun's kicking harder because the gun is cycling and the, the on an AR-15, for example, the buffer and the bolt are sliding to the rear. So even though it's less recoil, you might feel more of a ka-chunk when you're shooting with a silencer. Um, I prefer shooting with them. If it were up to me, every gun would have a silencer on it because it's just so much more fun shooting with them, um, especially if you're teaching someone how to shoot. So um, yeah, if you're looking for an excuse to buy one, then yes, Doug, uh, they make your rifle shoot better. Go buy one. <laughs> Uh, Travis asked me, what would I recommend for a factory barrel for an AR platform rifle in 308? Ah, that's tough. Well, I just gave a recommendation to a friend of mine uh, on Facebook here, and I don't know if he's having great luck with it. Uh, so I will uh, I will hold my, my uh, judgment until he gives me some feedback. But it's really hard to beat JP Rifles. I mean... JP knows what he's doing when it comes to making a rifle barrel. I mean, uh, obscenely accurate barrels. I think your little Rue barrels are really, really nice barrels. Um, if it were me building a 308, I would buy a LaRue or a JP barrel. Um, I hope that helps. I hope that's not out of the price range. Um, if that's, those are too expensive for you, ping me back and I can help you try and find something uh, more of a budget barrel. But those JP or LaRue have just been... Um, Great, 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 great. Uh, Steve, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. I appreciate you ordering the book. I appreciate the support. You guys are doing uh, so much help for the charities. It's awesome. So the Sue Esponte Foundation and the Special Operations Warrior Foundation um, have had thousands of dollars so far donated to them because of the books you guys are buying. So I really appreciate it. Um, thanks, Doug. Are, are you telling me about somebody else or are you talking about me? <laughs> Doug said, this guy is great on advice and his videos are easy to understand. So I hope he's just sharing that information. He's not telling me about somebody I can go learn from. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Remember, it doesn't have to be about guns if you don't want. Uh, maybe it might be fun to get off the gun topic. I don't know. Anything about outdoors. Camping, land navigation. I don't know. You want to talk about cars? Let's talk about cars. All right, so I hope I helped a little bit on the idea of accuracy and precision. Please. Uh, reevaluate how you think about this and it really takes coming back to the base level of figuring out what accuracy is. The accuracy that is inherent in the system is at a baseline nothing. Now I just kind of confused myself there but what I mean is 
everything you do to the gun, every component you add to the gun, every other variable you add, whether a bullet or barrel or position or stock, actually can take the accuracy away from the gun, okay? So things don't give accuracy, they just retain accuracy. So the most accurate thing is gonna be a barrel put in a giant vise bolted to concrete and never moving. That's gonna be the most accurate thing ever. The second you put a stock on it, that stock might flex too much. The stock might be rubbing, the stock might be doing something else. So that stock is going to maybe take some of the accuracy away. Well, precision, we covered that, but I'll just use the general term accuracy. So a great stock doesn't make the rifle more accurate. The great stock just allows the rifle to retain the accuracy that it had in the first place. Think about the same thing with the trigger. You don't put a trigger on there and all of a sudden the bolts start flying in random directions. No, a bad trigger might have you have bad trigger control or might have you pull too hard, which now means you're gonna degrade some of the precision and capability of the rifle. Whereas a good trigger helps you retain it. So think about it that way. You start with perfect accuracy and then the worst components you have and the worst skills and fundamentals you have, the more accuracy you take away. So you don't add accuracy to it. You don't chase after a fast bullet because fast is super accurate. No, accurate is consistent. Everything other than exactly the same every time is not accurate. So don't worry about speed. Don't worry about barrel length unless you're worried about energy on target, unless you're talking wind or things like that. But when it comes to accuracy, guys, stop thinking that a faster round's better or you gotta buy this great equipment and things like that. It's just all about minimizing all the variables. All right, Pat just asked, are there any more videos coming? Yes, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I bought this fancy microphone because I'm trying to figure out if I can do a podcast here and keep you guys with some regular information. Uh, well, I'm also starting to invest in all the video equipment and I just talked to a major manufacturer today that we've actually had this in plans for months and uh, just timing was perfect. They gave me a call and we're trying to figure out dates in the next couple of weeks. We can film a series of videos for them. So that'll be fun. And I hope in two months, I will have my own video channel up and running. I sat down and I mapped out uh, as many video topics or ideas as I could. And I got to a couple hundred. So without even really trying that hard. So uh, I hope the video channel is a constant source of information that will help you guys with stuff like that. Uh, Edward, just got your book, uh, very helpful. Just bought a Vortex Viper scope. Oh, I lost it. I'm having a hard time keeping up, guys. I appreciate the comments, but they're getting so many now, I can't see it. Let me see if I can pull this post uh, up and see the comments better. No, I can't. Um, well, if you can put the, the post back about the Vortex to the top, I'll answer it again, but I can't see it right now. Heath Davis, range finder recommendations for targets up to 600 yards max. Uh, Loophole makes great rangefinders and Vortex do. Um, either one of those. I haven't played with the SIG yet, uh, rangefinders. I've heard great things about them, but they're kind of an unknown for me right now, so I'd stick with the ones I really like, uh, Vortex and Loophole. Bob Bush, I'm happy through the handbook so far. Very easy to read and fun. Awesome. Glad you're liking it, Bob. Uh, look forward to the advanced copy. I hope to have it out by the end of this year. Uh, you guys, every time I tell a story about the book, it starts with, I thought my mom would buy one and a couple of my friends, but you guys have helped me sell you know, thousands of this book so far. It's been really great. Um, Mike, I don't have a question, but great job on the book. Thank you. I ain't going to lie, not done with it, but I love the layout and easy to understand, and you like the NSSF videos. I appreciate it. Mike, yeah, not afraid to do more videos. That's definitely doing them right now. Um, getting a chance to figure out how we're going to do them. We're going to do everything from long-range videos. I'll be doing handgun, AR-15, reloading. I hope to have just a whole slew of videos together. Uh, this weekend, I actually went and looked on my YouTube account, and I had 100 and something followers. I don't have a single video up there. So <laughs> I think that was maybe a clue that you guys might want some videos. So I'll start putting some up. I already forgot who it was to put the comment up about the Vortex that I lost, but please get that comment back up there, and uh, I'll try and answer it. Uh, Pat. Let's see if the video can come, the comment can come up. I'm seeing it, but I'm having a hard time, hard time with it right now. Hold on just a second, man. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Sorry guys, I'm reading through them here. Um, bum, bum, bum. Accurate. Pat, more offhand M107 thousand yard cold bore shots, please. <laughs> Uh, for those of you that don't know what Pat's talking about, uh, that's the luckiest shot I've ever made. Uh, go to YouTube and type in 
standing 1000 Barrett, and you'll see a, a pretty insane shot that I made. And I will be honest with you, uh, the hardest part about that shot was setting the rifle down and walking away like I meant to do it. Because <laughs> um, it surprised me as much as everybody else. Alright, I'm going through the comments right now trying to see if I can find that vortex question. I kind of lost it. You guys are doing great. Um, Edward, I think that's you coming back. Just bought the Vortex Viper Scope. You want to put it on a 300 Win Mag? Any load data suggestions? You've used the Barnes 180 grain TTSX before. Uh, great choice for hunting bullet. I really love the Barnes bullets. Now, this isn't a disparagement of Barnes. Okay, this isn't me saying anything bad about them. I just want you to know, I don't get match grade level super tight group accuracy out of those TTSX bullets. Um, I don't think that's a problem with the bullet. I think the bullet is an incredible hunting bullet. Um, I think the tightest I've ever had a group out of those is maybe three quarters of a minute. Now Barnes makes some awesome match grade bullets that you can do for putting little tiny groups and holes in paper, but that's a great uh, cartridge for 300 Win Mag. I think it'd be a great hunting round. Uh, low data suggestions. Off the top of my head, no, I have no idea. I'm so sorry, Edward. Um, I'm a big fan of H4895 for most of my rifles because I can use it from 223 up to 300 Win Mag. Um, and I can also do my reduced loads with it. So I would recommend grabbing the Barnes manual. If you need a picture of a manual, text me again later and I'll send you some load data uh, out of the book. But just go with what the manufacturers are recommending. Get a powder that you can use in other cartridges. That way you have more utility especially if you can get that H4895 because then uh, you can do those 60% loads, you know, those youth loads that are nice for you know, people to shoot. Uh, any other cartridge or any other powder, I'm sorry, isn't really recommended to do that with. So, all right, Edward, I hope that helps. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing a big discrepancy in the, in the comments between when they're coming in and how. I hope I can keep up with you all. Uh, Aaron, comment just came in. Just bought Remington 707 millimeter. Awesome. A scope mount recommendation, one piece or two piece. Well, what are you trying to do with it, Aaron? I think every one of my rifles, maybe one doesn't, every one of my rifles has a one piece. I just don't like the whole idea of a two piece mount. Remember, it's, accuracy is all about consistency. I don't like the idea that maybe one could wiggle loose or move without the other one. That might just be psychological. That may not be real at all. Uh, so I like one piece mounts, however, if you're using it for hunting and you want a lightweight rifle, do a two-piece mount. Or even better, you can get some of those rings where they're the base and the ring together in one system. Uh, those are pretty slick. You know, like the tally rings you can get where they just mount right in without a base at all. You can save a lot of weight and take extra parts out of your system, uh, which is always nice when you're out hunting. You have less things that can possibly fail. Uh, so there you go, Aaron. I hope that helps. Edward, just got the book. That's helpful. Good. Glad. Glad it's working out for you. All right, guys, these have been some great questions so far. Uh, asking for load data, which I'm not possibly going to have off the top of my head for 300 Mag, sorry. Uh, a lot of great questions about barrels. We covered, I think, you know, a good amount of the difference between precision and accuracy. We talked a little bit about how the rifling uh, is done in the barrels. If you guys have any more questions about that, shoot. You know, like why, why the twist matters or any more about cut rifling versus hammer forged versus button rifling. You know, we can talk about stuff like that. Um, uh, Bob, you have a question looks like I, I missed. Your only long range rifle is a Mauser K98, an eight millimeter Mauser. Any thoughts about that rifle? Well, that's awesome. I think that's great. Uh, I think you should, if that's your rifle for long range shooting, then have fun with it. You're gonna have a, a good time. Uh, I've seen some uh, older or not super modern carbon fiber, super sexy rifles just outperform them all day. Uh, I think the most inaccurate part of a rifle system is the shooter. It's not the rifle or the scope or the ammo, within reason, of course. When you, as long as your, your system is decent, the reason you're going to miss is usually the shooter. So a shooter that knows what they're doing with a Mauser K98, an 8mm Mauser, is going to have a great time. Uh, so awesome. Uh, Travis. Travis, uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember meeting you there, yeah. Making it big, yeah. Ma making it with my, with my big head on the screen. Thanks, man. Uh, all the folks on here have been been great for me for support for uh, for the books and everything else. This is my first attempt at uh, doing a little bit of a podcast. I did a radio show on here 
last week and it had such great response that I decided to uh, try a Tuesday night thing. Uh, tonight I wanted to get my cousin on here, uh, Jason. Uh, he and I decided it might be fun to do the podcast together and I don't have the technology figured out yet just because I just started doing this to figure out how to do a video cast and a podcast at the same time. So this podcast, I'm going to take the audio and I'll upload it, upload it later for you guys. And the audio is not going to be where you want it to be. Uh, it's going to have too much echo because the room, I don't have it set up right. But have some patience with me, I'm figuring it out. So it'll get better as we go. But I couldn't figure out how to have you guys be able to hear him on the phone. So once I figure that out, uh, we'll have an actual proper podcast going. So good to see you, Travis. Thanks for chiming in. All right, Blaine, uh, you've heard people talk about ladder tests to find a load your rifle likes with harmonics and the thousand yard ranges. Can you explain what this is? Um, yeah, so a ladder test is shooting groups one above the next, and it's called a ladder because they not only on the paper, but really a ladder because they're going up and down the charges, the charge weights. So a ladder test you can do on your own with as much accuracy, or I shouldn't say accuracy, with as much care as you want. So I have heard of guys doing ladder tests with every tenth of a grain. So they'll start with the recommended load range for a certain powder. They'll stick with a, a certain overall length and a certain bullet. And they will just load five rounds with each tenth of a grain in between. And they'll go out and on paper they'll just put the orange stickies and they'll write the marker next to them. And they'll just shoot each one. And essentially they're working their way up the ladder with these loads. And they, you should see... The groups be good, get really good, and then maybe get bad again. And there's that sweet spot in the middle, which goes back to what I was saying. Faster is not always better. There's going to be a sweet spot somewhere. The problem with those tests is one, they take forever to do. Uh, I'm not saying you can't, you can skip it. You got to do it. But they take forever to do, and they're just prone to error. So if you can uh, have someone, a friend, bark them for you. So put random numbers on them. So I like to just on the end of, inside of my ammo case, I put a piece of masking tape. You have to draw you know, what each row is. Have them put random numbers and have them be the only one that knows which one's which. Then shoot the five that say number seven at the dot that says number seven. And then when you're done with those groups, go to your buddy and see what those groups were. Because what will happen is you're going to have a favorite for one or you're going to have a bad group that was because of you and not the cartridge. And it's real easy for us to look at it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, see the group got big again towards the end. That must have been because it was too fast when really it might have just been you. Um, so more testing is better and doing it a blind system like that is a fun way to do it. Uh, I recommend doing a half grain to start. So if your range is from 36 to 39, load 10 up for 36, 36 and a half, 37 and so on. So you're not loading so many rounds. Shoot a couple groups to make sure that you can consistently shoot the group and it's not the, the uh, velocity or anything that's got a problem. Uh, and then you can figure it out from there and fine tune it. But as a rule, if I just start somewhere, um, Blaine, I'm going to look at what is about 100 to 102% case capacity. I have no idea why, but just magically, if you I look at the load data uh, on, on a cartridge case, you know, recommended, and it says 99 to maybe 102, I'm going to pick that one. Because when a case is filled to that capacity with that bullet, it's just something magic happens. You don't want a whole lot of free space, you don't want a whole lot of compression, but it just works. So I, I don't know if that helped you at all. Uh, maybe I'll do a video on how to do a ladder test for you, Blaine, and maybe I'll explain it. And I'd love to see your results. Don't be afraid to share what, what you had, you know, uh, your experience with the range. Uh, Bob just asked what the address for the podcast is. I have no idea yet, Bob. This is maybe the first one, and I might not even put it up because the audio is going to be so bad because I can hear my dogs outside, and I can hear my family running around, and I have all the echoing going on. And I feel too bad uh, putting this out there as a product that you guys would be listening to. Um, but part of what I'm hoping you guys are going to help me do is figure out a title tonight. Because I figured all the tech out on the background. I have the iTunes account ready. All I have to do is submit the first one. And you're not allowed to start the podcast channel until the first one's submitted. And that's when they ask you the title. And I just don't know about the title. I was thinking about something simple like Kleckner on guns. But maybe we'll talk about things other than guns. Um, maybe that sounds like Kleckner's on drugs. I have no idea. Uh, so if you think of a good name for me, Bob, let me know. I'll figure it out. I'd like to somehow have my name in there for recognition and something about the outdoors or hunting or shooting so people know what the podcast is about. Um, either way, you'll be able to find it through ryankleckner.com. I was up too late last night playing with it and redoing it. 
up until last night it was for my uh, law practice. And I decided, you know what, I'm just going to make one website to host podcasts, to host all these new videos I'm going to start in a couple of months, to host this book and my next books, and Bob, to hold my rifles. Had a final conversation today with the guy that's going to be helping me with a lot of the manufacturing. Yes, um, collecting rifles are actually happening. So the paperwork is pending with the ATF right now for some licensing issues uh, to get them all done. And very shortly, we will have ultra premium as in, uh, I, I challenge you to find something better, rifle. And I also am going to have, true to the way I like to teach and, and discuss long-range shooting, I'm going to have entry-level rifles, so it's not uh, inaccessible for a lot of people. Uh, Ursula writes, what is a good dry fire drill for positional bolt gun shooting? Um, you're going to think this is sarcastic, and it might be Ursula, I'm sorry, but it's getting into whatever position you want to shoot in dry firing. <laughs> That's the good drill. So when you're dry firing, you should be doing one thing primarily. That is making the gun go click, for lack of a better term, because it's going to be dry, uh, without the reticle moving. And if you can focus on the reticle only, remember you don't look at the target, if you can focus on the reticle only, have the gun go click and the reticle not move, and the reticle be where it needed to be when the gun went click, that's going to be a hit. If you can do that over and over and focus on what the reticle is, it's not only going to make you better for your position, so get in the position you're supposed to be shooting in, that's how you're going to get better at it. You know, you get better at push-ups by doing push-ups. Um, so you'll get in those positions and dry fire, but focusing on the reticle is not only going to make sure and test whether your muscles were able to hold you in that position and your breathing and everything else was right. What it's going to do is it's going to reinforce in your brain the necessity to focus only on the reticle and pay attention exactly where the reticle was. Because that's going to help you call your shots. And if you guys have read my book, you know I'm a big, big believer in being able to call your shots. So dry fire practice is not only for getting your body in the right position mechanically, it's also getting you in the right, uh, the right spot psychologically to be able to call your shots and focus on the reticle. Um, so that's the best drill, uh, is just do the simple and get really good at it. And then if you want, you can change things up uh, as far as your imagination will go. All right, Matthew asks, I recently just built an AR-10 style rifle. Unfortunately, there's very little clearance between the handguard and the gas block. I'm only 50-ish rounds into the JP precision barrel. Good choice, Matthew, as we just discussed. But I am only seeing, I can't see the rest of your comments. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, not finding it, let me try. I can't see the rest of your comment, Matthew. I assume you're asking how much of a clearance issue is a problem. The easiest way to tell is take your handguard off. Again, I'm answering without seeing the rest of your question. Is take the handguard off and look for where between the handguard and the gas block. If they're making contact, you're actually going to be able to see it. Okay, so you'll you'll be able to um, you'll take it off and then see. Oh, here we go. Do you, I only see a little over one minute of angle accuracy? Do you think I need to allow a longer barrel break in or look at replacing the gas block that could be rubbing against the handguard? Well, first, do, the, do what I was recommending. Take the handguard off. See if the gas block is touching. Uh, if there's no signs of wear at all, then that's likely not your issue at all. Um, but being that close on AR-10 might be happening. Uh, you might be getting, uh, it might be nicking and kissing the handguard. But again, that's not the end of the world. You have a gas tube that's connected to a bolt carrier that is leaving and jamming back onto that and moving everything around. So honestly, if it kicks the handguard a little bit, it's probably not the end of the world, um, as long as it kicks it the same every time. Remember, consistency is the key to accuracy. I would look at your position. I would look at your ammunition. Uh, I would look at your scope. I would look at things like that before I'd be worried about the barrel break-in. I'm not a big believer in that. You get a barrel like a JP barrel, you aren't breaking it in. He hand lead laps those barrels. They're, they're done for you. Um, so, yeah, focus on ammo first, scope second. On AR-10s especially, you're prone to have a bad position because the way the mag well and the handguard, the pistol grip sticks down and how you can't get a good cheek rest or I can't anyway because of the charging handle. So you tend to be in awkward positions and then we expect the same accuracy out of a bolt gun, which yes, it can do it when it's locked in a vise. It's just harder to do because the ergonomics of the gun uh, they lend themselves better for, um, I don't want to use the term assault, because heaven forbid, they le lend themselves more to uh, quick firing. Um, the pistol grip, the, the ergonomics of it allow you to control the gun, and as we just talked about before, 
you're the most inactive part of the system. So the more you control the gun, probably the worse it's going to be. So uh, another thing you can try is when you're shooting an AR style rifle, take that firing thumb and get it off to the other side. Uh, it's just a little tip or trick that if you have the ability and the time to do it, it keeps you from gripping the rifle too much and torquing it too much. Uh, who knows, you might see an improvement. If you have a chance that you're safe, you can even move it to the other side so you can operate the safety on the other side. Um, Doug, Ryan's brain picking. Yes, that's what you guys are doing right now. Um, hope you guys are enjoying this. Uh, if it's something you want me to keep up, uh, I'll keep it up for you guys maybe once a week. Uh, I might not be able to do the podcast like this because it's a little difficult, as you guys are seeing, uh, reading the comments and responding at the same time, and it might not be very exciting for people driving in their car while they're listening to it. Uh, so uh, I might do a Q&A session like this every so often and then do an actual proper podcast uh, where I can get into some more detail later. Uh, I guess the only downside to that is you're just going to hear me ramble for, you know, too long. So... Uh, thank you for the suggestion, Travis. Um, that truly uh, means I guess I can't decide. I have a buy podcast. I, I, I wonder if I assume that's what you're getting at. Uh, Bob, get a certain microphone. I'll be very happy with it. Clicks with Kleckner. Nice. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. I suggested the Pew Pew podcast as kind of a joke, and I get a lot of groans when I have that one. Um, I think it's just going to be the Ryan Kleckner show or something like that. Uh, get back in. All right, my back. You guys see me okay? All right, that was the cousin that was going to be on uh, the podcast, hopefully with me in the future, just calling in uh, to the very phone I'm using. So, any other questions, guys? These comments are great. I, I appreciate them. Looks like we have 15 folks on right now. Anything else you guys get questions on? Matthew, is that, is that what you were asking about? Are those enough things for you to go try? I ask you guys, when you're trying to diagnose problems, because that's really what about long range shooting is, is it's fun because there's going to be something not working right, so you want to diagnose it over and over. Do one at a time. Um, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to change the gas block, but you're also going to try the grip I talked about, and you're going to change the scope, and you're going to go out and you're going to convince yourself that one thing or another was the was the solution and you're not even sure. So take the time to change one thing at a time and that means shooting the same ammo. So if I'm trying to diagnose a problem with a gun, I might just go get factory ammo uh, just to make sure that I have a good baseline to go off of. I'm not saying that they can load it more accurate than I can, but at least I know that it's not me doing too much or too little pressure or things like that. All right, Blaine came in with a question for me. What are my opinions on fire forming a case? For instance, a 2250 to a 65 Creedmoor versus necking down a 308 to a 260. I'm guessing both will sacrifice a certain amount of consistency, but is one better than the other? Blaine, um, here's some proof that I'm being honest with you guys. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I like the idea of necking down only because brass has a limited life, and even though necking down still works the brass, you're working the brass uh, quite a bit harder, I think, when fire forming. Um, again, that may just be personal preference, maybe just opinion, I have no idea. Uh, but I'd rather not go through primers and powder and loading if I don't have to. So if I can get the brass from 308 to 260, which you can, as long as you just check your neck tension and thickness, um, I'd rather do that than fire form. Uh, I already have too little time as it is. Uh, to go all the way up the range just to fire form is kind of a pain for me. But that's also why I like 260 over 65 Creedmoor. Uh, one, it gets you a little more case capacity so it's, you, know, you can get more performance out of it. But two, I have buckets full of three, three weight brass that I can just resize and I'm good to go. Uh, with a 6.5, it's got that little shoulder dent issue you can have to fire for them. Blaine, I hope that helps. That's purely my opinion. I, I can't back that up with anything. Sorry. All right, Matthew, you noticed in my book that my daytime job is an attorney and some of my work is firearms related. I think that would be a really cool subtopic of the show. Ah, oh, thanks, Matt. Um, well... The problem is I'll, I'll geek out on that. So it's not some of my work as firearms related. I think pretty much all of it is. It's all either ATF or State Department or, or somehow helping companies, especially dealers or manufacturers, uh, stay in business and then get going. Um, I'd be more than happy to discuss uh, firearms law related stuff. Uh, the problem is even though I'm an attorney, I'm not your attorney. So 
I'll, I guess I'd have to be careful on some of the advice I gave. Um, but if you guys have questions, especially when it comes to uh, firearms technology, meaning uh, not how a gun works, but what guns are what, you know, is it pistol grip shotgun, is it really a shotgun at all, or, or is it an AOW, or when does it become one way or the other? Uh, if there's FFLs out there and have any questions, of course, reach out to me. I'd love to take you on as a client, uh, but I can help out with advice for them that might not appeal to the rest of y'all on 4473s and A&D books. Um, but I'm happy to help however I can. Thanks for the suggestion, Matt. Blaine, let me know if I have answered your question for you, please. Uh, I, I only, I'm going back to that one because that's the one I just don't know for sure off the top of my head. I'm just kind of making my opinion on, so hope that helps. Holy cow, we're already 55 minutes into the show. So I think I'm going to start wrapping it up here. Uh, if any more comments come in, I'll be more than happy to address them. But any other topic I try to get into is probably going to get me off on too much of a tangent. So let me refresh to everybody what we started with. Talk about the difference between accuracy and precision. I hope at least half of you, that was an aha moment that you might not have known before. Uh, we talked about what makes a rifle precise or the ability for a rifle to be accurate in the right hands. And it has nothing to do with a certain variable. It has nothing to do with a certain speed or a certain straightness of a barrel or a certain anything. It just has to do with consistency. And you can be consistent with a short barrel or a long barrel. Uh, you'll be sacrificing other things if you get a short barrel. Um, but it doesn't have to be something magic. And we then kind of got onto a segue of that, which is, or a sidetrack of that, which is certain things don't make a gun more accurate. What they do is they can only take the accuracy away of the gun. So remember, the most accurate thing is going to be a barrel and a vice. That's it. Everything you do is taking accuracy away. You just buy expensive components because one, it's fun to buy gun stuff, but two, because they're more consistent, they're more accurate. So they allow you to retain most of the accuracy you had in the system instead of lose it to a stock that might be different every time or things like that. Uh, we got into some low development. We got into how barrels are made. Uh, we, we talked about a lot of stuff. So I hope you guys had a fun time. Uh, if you like the show, put some kind comments on there and keep me motivated to do some more. As I figure out how to do the podcast formally, I apologize for any of you that downloaded this podcast and it's, uh, it's bad audio or you had a hard time listening along. I will get better at it. Um, so, Mark, don't be bummed. You didn't miss out on anything. He just said he just tuned in. He's bummed out. You have 57 minutes of video you can go back and watch. I'll keep these videos up on Facebook so you can go back and watch them whenever you want. Um, I tell you what, I'll be here next Tuesday night. If you guys want to be here uh, to ask questions and pick my brain and, and talk about stuff again, then uh, you be here too, all right? All right, everybody, stay safe. Take care.